Thank you for joining our live coverage here on Wealthion of Election 2024. I'm joined with the host of Speak Up, our own Anthony Scaramucci. Anthony, very happy to have you join us, and I know you're a busy man today. Andrew, I'm sorry I'm in the back of the car. I just I got blindsided by a number of media engagements for the Harris team, but uh, you know, uh, you're looking good. How are you? Everything good? Everything is good. We'll we'll see later how everything is good, although I don't know the how much later it will be when we know what's going on. Let us know, Anthony, what you're hearing about the election right now, and then we'll get into a, a few different facts and figures. I know you have to run in about 15 minutes. So just quickly, you know, the uh, and again, I want to be as balanced as possible because this is an investment show. I think that there's a, uh, uh, you know, I think that the Harris team is confident about the blue wall. And I think the Trump team would say that they're going to win Pennsylvania. So, you know, Andrew, it actually, to me, uh, after looking at all the data, this thing is going to come down to Pennsylvania. So we've got 180,000 Amish that have registered to vote. But they say they're voting for Donald Trump. Uh, we have four or 500,000 other uh, young women, uh, black men, et cetera, that are registering, saying that they're going to vote for the vice president. You know, uh, the vice president had a killer team in Pennsylvania. Uh, as an example, uh, yesterday, 807,000 doors were knocked. 940,000 people were called from the phone bank. And of course, the team has buses taking people to polling booths right now. So a, a door gets knocked. How you doing? Yes, I'm going to vote for the vice president. Great. Do you need a ride to the uh, the polling booth? Yes, I do. OK, so they've got buses and so on and so forth. So the question is, is that ground game going to be enough for her to win in Pennsylvania? Up against that, I think Trump has, frankly, a better understanding of that state. I think he moved himself around that state more efficiently and with greater impact. And the vice president did something last night that I would not have done. She had a celebrity concert, uh, and that was very coincident to what Hillary Clinton did in 2016. And, you know, Donald Trump was in a farm field in western Pennsylvania in 2016, while Secretary Clinton was at the Wells Fargo region with a lot of elites. Uh, uh, the Harris team ended the campaign with that. Uh, maybe it's my superstition. I wouldn't have done that. I would have had those 20,000 people out working. Um, let me just say, make two more comments and then uh, go over to Trump for a few seconds and then take another question. But but uh, they also believe that they've got a real shot in North Carolina. So the Democratic candidate, Stein, who's running for governor, uh, they think he's up 13 points right now. Uh, if that's the case, they think that that's enough of a positive drag to get them over uh, with uh, in, in North Carolina. If that happens, that opens up the entire map for her. Uh, and those polls will be announced nine o'clock tonight because they close at seven. So look for those two polls. If she loses Georgia and North Carolina, she's got one way to get to the presidency left. That's through the blue wall. Of course, Pennsylvania, because of the way they vote count you won't know that for a few days frank lunds is saying saturday i don't believe that i think sometime by late thursday you'll know on the trump side they are wildly confident i mean they're texting me that i'm going to be heading to guantanamo bay uh they've got me on the first uh, i guess first ferry boat to guantanamo uh they're telling people that they're going to win seven out of the seven states and they're wildly confident the data doesn't suggest that by the way but but the data is so close andrew that, you know, the likely outcome is one of these two candidates wins six of the seven states. If you wake up and you've learned that Vice President Harris has won six of the seven states, that means that they underpolled her people by a slight. That's why they have these margins of error in the polls mm -hmm. uh, or conversely, Donald Trump's people. But she does feel like she has more enthusiasm right now. But Trump is uh, sneaky with the silent voters. You know, there are people that get the phone call. Are you voting for Trump? No, I'm not voting for Trump. They hang up the phone and they send in their absentee ballot or they go vote for Trump. So, so very, very tight. Anybody that tells you, Oh yeah, I know exactly what's going to happen tonight does not know. And, uh, but for me, it's all, all roads lead back to Pennsylvania. And it seems like you're going to have a lot of company on that bus to wherever it's going. But, uh, 
Anthony, what does it mean that the stock market today is up? You know, Dow is up about 400, NASDAQ up over 200. Any meaning to that? So there, I think it's a little bit of a snapback rally. The market has been soft the last couple of days. Crypto market soft the last couple of days. Um, uh, traders will say that's an indication that Trump is winning. Uh, I think Wall Street generally, the consensus is that Trump is winning. The predictive markets have him winning. And And uh, Mitt Romney was, uh, quote unquote, winning. And even though the polls were statistically tied, those margins of errors actually broke for Barack Obama. He won sort of 53, 47. Uh, but, you know, Wall Street saying that he's going to win. Now, um, you know, Stan Druckenmiller had a good point. Wall Street's generally been right about these things. They've got a lot of information. Thousands of research analysts are calling through this data. And so, you know, if you were looking at Wall Street, you're saying Trump's going to win. If you're looking at her field operation, you're saying, well, she's going to win. Uh, and so, again, it's still a toss up. But I, I, I do think that the market, uh, you know, is sort of telling it's 50, 50 point one Trump, 49 point nine in terms of the chances for Harris. You know, I do I do think that looking at those numbers, again, being as objective as possible, you'd have to say that's a positive sign for Donald Trump. Yeah, but if a couple people are not feeling well and don't get to the polls, <laughs> that could swing either way because it's that close. Uh, you know, you brought up Stanley Druckenmiller, and he, he's very concerned about the debt and where we're going. Both of these candidates are going to add to the debt. Different ways, of course, Trump is talking about tariffs. Uh, Kamala Harris talking about cutting taxes for the middle and lower classes and trying to, you know, make up the difference other ways. Where we sit on the debt, Anthony, and and how does this, how do you think this has affected this election? So it's interesting. So I had a debate with Vivek Ramaswamy this morning on CNBC, and uh, you know, he 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 and I are going to be in violent disagreement about the tariffs. He says that. Uh, uh, you know, Joe Biden left every single tariff in place. That's factually inaccurate. He left some strategic Chinese tariffs in place that were related to protecting some industries and related to our national security. But he did not leave every tariff in place. And so you have to use the tariffs in a delicate way. You don't want to touch off a global trade war. We certainly need to protect our industries. But one other big thing and one other big negative, if they go hog wild on the tariffs, you're going to have a wipeout of disposable income for middle and lower income people. So Elon Musk is telling people quite honestly, sort of, uh, uh, you know, Elon is not a politician. He's many things and arguably one of the most successful people in the world, but he's not a politician. He, he's saying, oh, you know, we're going to put in these measures with the Department of Government officially. There'll be two or three years of catastrophic economic activity in the United States. And so, I can tell you that austerity is never the right thing to do uh, for a government that has 25, 26 percent of the GDP. I can tell you that if we cut, if we took Elon Musk at his word and uh, we took Donald Trump at his word, uh, we're going to go into a depression. Because if you're going to cut two trillion dollars of spending, first of all, I don't even know if they could legally do that based on the uh, obligations that they have in terms of these entitlement spending. But we're going to cut two trillion in, in spending. You're going to take tariffs up to three hundred percent. As the vice president pointed out, that's generally a sales tax on lower and middle income people. And then the third leg of the stool economically is you're going to deport people. So, as I pointed out to uh, Vivek this morning, you want to deport two million people. Okay, that's going to cost you eighty eight billion dollars. You are going to have to put them in camps. You'll have to concentrate them in camps. You'll have to drive around in our cities and SWAT teams and pull these people out of houses. And uh, that'll hurt our tax base. It'll hurt our GDP. Uh, it'll hurt our contributions to Social Security. So if you want to do all those things, OK, but you're calling for a massive economic depression if you do all three of those things. So so I like her plan better. Lots of economists. Maybe there were 24 
Nobel Prize winner said her plan reduces the deficit, at least deficits growing, but it's going to come down as a percentage of overall GDP. Uh, her tax rates are a little higher. There's no question about that. Nobody obviously wants to pay higher taxes, but can't do what we're doing now. You've got uh, lots of deficit spending. And Andrew, you know that's unfunded tax liability. So you're going to pay it one way or the other. You're going to pay it in terms of the monetization of the debt through inflation, or you're going to pay it through the uh, uh, actually having to pay it, meaning to the tax man and the IRS. So one way or another, we have to pay this stuff. You can't, can't, can't be in a position to overpromise the electorate like we've been doing, which has been very damaging to living standards. Went through the economic plans, Anthony, and, and something really, really struck me. We have a corporate tax rate of 21 percent. Donald Trump wants to lower it to 15 percent. Kamala Harris wants to raise it to 28 percent. Before Trump took office the first time, it was 35 percent. They brought it down to 21 percent. Now, corporate tax rate at 21 percent. I looked at individual tax rates for a individual that's making $100,000, they're paying 24%. And for a married couple, they're also of $200,000, they are paying 24%. So the individual is paying more than the corporate tax. Anthony, how is this fair? I'm working for the government. I'm paying over 51% tax because I live in New York. The taxes are high. You live in New York. It's, it's, it's crazy. How are individuals paying more money than corporations? Well, uh, again, I think one of the one of the, the corporations would push back and say, don't judge the corporate tax versus the individuals, judge it on a global basis. And let's look at where corporations are taxed around the world. And where does the United States rank in terms of where those corporations are taxed? At 35 percent, we were ranked lowest. At 21 percent, we're at the top now, meaning we have very reasonably favorable tax rates. I think the Harris team would say 28% is a necessary thing to do. Uh, Trump would push back, though. He'd say, OK, tax them at 28%. They'll leave for Ireland. They'll leave for the Cayman Islands. They'll go to places that will help them shelter these taxes. And, uh, you know, so we don't want that either. You know, you have to always find the harmony between these two things, the intersection of what's good for the deficit, what's good for our tax revenues, but doesn't blow people out of the seat. You know, when Trump limited, and you're a New Yorker, so am I, when Trump limited the state and local income tax deduction to $10,000, he caused mass migration. You know, since 2017, we've lost over 500,000 people in New York, over 500,000 people in California, and it hasn't really helped. And I, I, and I, when I was talking to Trump, this is going way back, December 2017, is you have to remember these port cities are economic engines for the rest of the country. You know, people come in, generally come in poor. I'm talking about people coming in legally, they come in poor. The Sergey Brins go on to create Google, the Elon Musks go on to create Tesla and SpaceX. You know, it's one of these things where uh, we got to be uh, mindful of helping these people on the way through the door. So you need these social safety nets in these areas. And I think it was much smarter to have the income tax deduction. So, you know, taxes, Andrew, whether we like it or not, they're incentives. Uh, they motivate people. Uh, you can't overtax them. They'll run. Uh, you don't want to undertax them, though, while we have all these goods and uh, services going on. Well, Anthony, we'll uh, keep. Uh, I know you have to run. Let where are you? Where are you next? I know you're doing a TV hit short. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to be streaming live. I'll put it up on my Instagram. I've got our uh, our show. The rest is politics. U.S. Uh, we have our uh, sister podcast in town. I'm down here at the uh, Four World Trade Center. I'm about to go in there. Uh, it's an eight hour show, Andrew. So pray for me. <laughs> pray for my voice. Pray for my hydration. <laughs> OK, pray for the fact that I'm 60 and I'm probably going to have to go to the bathroom like 500 times uh, during the course of the show. Uh, but we'll be live all night uh, streaming and providing analysis. We've got tons of guests coming on and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the whole thing. Anthony, thanks for doing what you do. Thank you for taking a few minutes to join us here on Wealthion. We'll look forward to seeing Speak Up coming up on Friday. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Right, you're doing a good job with your hair, too, though, Andrew. I noticed you must have a good 
Must have a good stylus. I got to fix I my hair. The same person, so it's all no, good. No, 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 you're doing good, Andrew. I'm looking at that hair. I like it. All right, I'll see you soon. Thanks very much, Anthony. And don't forget to join us tomorrow at noon. We'll be back live with a hopefully post-election analysis of who may win if we have a winner. As you heard from Anthony, we may not until Thursday, but we're going to do our best to bring you everything there is to know about the winner of this election, if there is one, and we'll break down economically for your pocketbook and mine what might happen next. Thanks so much for joining us here on the live Wealthy on edition of Election 2024 and what it means for you and for me. That's a wrap on another discussion here on Wealthy, and thank you for joining us. If you need help being financially resilient, please head over to Wealthion.com and sign up for a free no-obligation portfolio review with one of our registered investment advisors. And remember to follow us on social media for the latest news and information to help you invest wisely. And if you could like and subscribe to the channel, we'd greatly appreciate it. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can find out when we post new videos to the channel. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, stay informed, be empowered, and may your investments flourish. And if you like this content, please watch this video next.